Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast of Informing Clinical Interpretations of Structural Chromosome Rearrangements, Implementing Evolving Knowledge from Chromatin Structure. I'm Cynthia Morton. I'm a professor at Harvard Medical School and the director of cytogenetics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. I will be answering questions via email after our live presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen. Or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. Without further ado, I will now begin today's presentation. It's been my pleasure to have a professional career as a clinical cytogeneticist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. There were some days, though, that were less than satisfying when I had to deliver information to a patient which was less clear than we would have liked it to have been. But those days are changing now. We have much more information about our genome from the Human Genome Project. And I'm gonna share with you how that has changed the type of information we can give to individuals with chromosome rearrangements. In today's presentation, I'll first speak about chromatin organization and human disorders through the perspective of constitutional balanced chromosome rearrangements, and in particular, discuss disrupted genes and dysregulated genes. Secondly, I'll talk about computational prediction of position effects, non-coding chromosome rearrangements, and our analysis strategy. So you might want to know, why is the evolving knowledge of genome organization important for a clinical cytogeneticist? How can this information impact diagnosis and prognosis in the clinical laboratory today? And how might an understanding of genome structure play into future treatments for patients? I want to introduce you to a project that my laboratory fondly knows as DGAP for the Developmental Genome Anatomy Project. The hypothesis of this project is that chromosomal rearrangements in individuals with congenital anomalies can be etiologic in the abnormal phenotype due to disruption or dysregulation of genes critical in human development. This is a paradigm of human genetics from which we have made many gene discoveries. This is an overview of the DGAP study design. We begin with a blood sample from a patient who has been identified to have a structural chromosome rearrangement. We then employ whole genome sequencing jumping libraries, a next generation sequencing method to identify the rearrangement breakpoints. We sequence across the breakpoints to nucleotide level precision to identify candidate genes. And then we validate those candidate genes by a number of methods, including animal and cellular models, and nowadays doing quite a bit of our analysis and validation by database mining for gene function. Now, I'm a real fan of genome-wide association studies where we no longer have to look under the lamppost to find the gene that we're interested in. But in this particular project, it turns out all the keys are under the lamppost. So the chromosomal rearrangements provide the signpost for us for the gene of interest in the disorder. 
Here's just an overview of the jumping library methodology that we use. It's a traditional next generation sequencing library method with the exception that the inserts that we use are a bit larger. So if you look on the bottom uh, row, you can see a 2KB fragment, which is bounded by the red and green rectangles, which are indicating different portions of a chromosome which may involve, be involved in a, re, in a rearrangement. So this is a read which includes a portion from two different chromosomes as you would have in a chromosome translocation. What we're looking for are sequences in reads that are not aligned to the reference genome. So a model would be that chromosome A and chromosome B are found on the same sequencing read. So that tells us that we've crossed the chromosomal breakpoint, whether it's a translocation or an inversion. And then we're able to design PCR primers to go in and sequence directly across that to resolve the chromosomal rearrangement to nucleotide level precision. Here's a summary of the different genes that we have found in chromosomal rearrangements over the 15 years of the project. You may note that some are indicated by blue font. These are the ones that were the original time of the project when we didn't have next generation sequencing. And you can see then those in red and green which have all been found since we were able to employ next generation sequencing methods. So you'll notice that they are uh, on all the different human chromosomes. So there's no chromosome that is specifically uh, more likely to be in a rearrangement as um, the, in, in this patients that we have analyzed. So I want to talk to you to exemplify uh, the changes that are occurring in our ability to interpret cases by one of my favorite cases, which we'll call DGAP-103. DGAP-103 involves a chromosomal inversion, a pericentric inversion involving the centromere in one of the homologs of chromosome 12 that you'll see on the right side of the screen. So there's a simple, apparently balanced inversion. The patient had the following clinical features, and this patient, a male, as you'll notice from the uh, cytogenetic nomenclature underneath the carto cartoons of, of chromosome 12, and also you'll note from that nomenclature that this is a de novo chromosome rearrangement, meaning that neither of his parents carried this rearrangement. So this individual came into our study um, when he was about eight years old with the clinical features of multiple lipomas, overgrowth, which had been noted by his parents since about two months of age, so greater than the 95th percentile, arthritis, advanced dental and bone ages, bilateral bowing of legs, brachydactyly of hands and feet, and facial dysmorphism. So, I think you'll agree that these aren't typical findings that you would see in an eight-year-old. Here's the picture of DGAP-103, and you can perhaps appre appreciate the dental overgrowth. Um, in the center picture, these lumps that you see on his legs are lipomas, and then there is the histology associated with the lipomas. In the bottom, you'll see on the left side the enlarged joints and the brachydactyly um, in the middle, the bowing of the legs, and then in the radiographs, the uh, flared epiphyses. So DGAP-103 has his own Wikipedia page, and he's known at the time of this Wikipedia posting for being the tallest teenager on Earth. And at that point, when he was about 14 years old, he was seven feet, four and a half inches tall. At that time, his endocrinologist uh, arrested his growth by treatment with high-dose testosterone. So here's DGAP-103 
entering Children's Hospital with his mother and his half-sibling. I think you'll appreciate his um, height and you can still see on his legs the lumps that are from the lipomas and the uh, facial dysmorphism, including the dental overgrowth. And in this particular picture reminds me to tell you that he had had 12 additional molars taken out in the previous year. You'll see his fingers now as a 14-year-old, um, where, where the, the digits are short still and the, the fingers are enlarged. But on the bottom, you'll see why he was entering the hospital. Here's his spleen, which was about the size of a football, and the normal size would be somewhere around the size of your fist. So this was a surgery that was performed to uh, be sure that um, he wouldn't get into any type of life-threatening situation from perhaps being hit in the belly accidentally um, and having a bleed from this spleen. So it turns out that we were able to map the breakpoint of his rearrangement on chromosome 12 on the long arm into a region uh, at band Q14.3, which harbors the gene HMGA2. We were not surprised at all that this is a gene that was involved in his overgrowth syndrome because this is a gene which we had been studying in the laboratory for its involvement in a very common tumor in women known as uterine fibroids. And these tumors uh, have display overgrowth and um, we certainly see that there's an overgrowth syndrome that's underway with this chromosome rearrangement. One of the things we need to do in the DGAP project is to validate that the gene that we implicate by our sequencing is actually the gene that's involved and that we don't have the situation where the finding is true that there is a chromosome rearrangement and that the individual has a phenotype but they're unrelated. So we look for various lines of evidence and in this particular case, we were able to validate the findings of lipo lipomas and overgrowth by the fact that uh, they have both been observed in two mouse models with HMGA2 truncation. And I might mention that HMGA2 is also recognized as um, etiologic in some in human lipomas as well. Uh, he also, as you know, um, had an arthritic symptoms, and we have evidence that HMGA2 is rearranged in synovia of patients, some patients with osteoarthritis. What was also interesting were findings that came post us publishing this paper, in which variants in HMGA2 were found to influence human height. And this was from a genome-wide association study, which involved over 19,000 adults from four other studies in children and a tall, short case control study. HMGA2 is recognized to explain about 0.3% of population variation in height. So I often like to say to my GWAS colleagues, well, you know, this study required over 19,000 individuals. Uh, and in some cases, such as this, valuable information can be obtained from one patient. So this is really an, an N of one uh, finding that this gene is very important in influencing human height. Well, there was one part of that phenotype that really didn't sit very well with our findings, and that was the finding of brachydactyly. I was really fortunate in my life to have the opportunity to serve as the editor of the American Journal of Human Genetics. And one afternoon, a paper appeared in my, on my desk uh, from the laboratory of Stefan Manlos, entitled Deletion and Point Mutations of PTHLH cause brachydactyly type E. Well, I knew this gene. 
because it was the gene that was telomeric to the breakpoint on the short arm of chromosome 12. And it's located, as you can see, in the breakpoints above at 12P12.1 to P11.2. So we had looked in the regions of the inversion to be sure that there might not be a fusion transcript, and this was the gene that was the closest uh, to that short arm breakpoint. So now it seemed very likely that the etiology of DGAP-103's brachydactyly had to do with dysregulation of parathyroid hormone-like hormone. Well, how do we think about dysregulation of genes? It's easy to sort of understand a gene that's disrupted, and that might change the expression, um, abrogate the expression of that particular gene. But, but what about genes that are not actually at the breakpoints? And I was fortunate, actually, to be in the audience at the American, at the, excuse me, European Society of Human Genetics meeting um, in 2015, when a paper also coming from Stefan Munlo's lab was uh, presented which was entitled, Disruptions of Topological Chromatin Domains Cause Pathogenic Rewiring of Gene Enhancer Interactions. This paper made it clear to me that we needed to look in the neighborhood of our chromosomal rearrangements, such as looking in the neighborhood that would have included parathyroid hormone-like hormone to explain the phenotypes and I highly recommend this paper. It, it was such an, a moment for me in terms of thinking about relooking at many cases that we had already studied, and I was anxious to get back to my laboratory in Boston and um, try to understand some of these cases better. So this leads me just to uh, remind you that our genome is, has a is highly structured and that chromosomes live in territories and you can see them sort of indicated as uh, different colored um, entities in, a, in, in the nucleus. And this actually had been recognized for some time by uh, cytogeneticists uh, who used chromosome painting methods and saw that there was a non-random positioning of chromosomes in the nucleus. Well, we've now become able to recognize that um, below this level, at a, at a higher level of resolution in the 10 megabase to 1 megabase region, we have chromatin organized in something known as topological associating domains, and that'll be an important part of the rest of this presentation. And then that when we look at the um, even further uh, higher resolution, um, there is our chromatin is organized into loops in which the blue coding sequence of the gene, which is preceded by its promoter region, is interacting with an enhancer region that is involved in regulating that gene. So we have a, a really highly organized uh, genome. And if you look to the left side on the, on the screen, you'll see, again, the colors in the nucleus, and then a schematic of the chromatin, which is uh, uh, um, unwound or, or um, less highly condensed, um, sort of the spaghetti uh, lines that you see on the, in, in B on, on the figure on the left. And then below, a schematic of the interaction of inside a topological domain, which is bounded by these purple uh, structures, and then genes inside the, that tent, which are regulated by various um, elements. So let's think about what happens when you have a chromosomal rearrangement, such as an inversion, which we saw in DGAP-103. So the, there are two uh, tads in the top of the figure on the, on the, in the wild-type situation or cartoon on the right, and you can see that um, there are genes inside 
the TAD on the right, the TAD B, which um, has uh, an enhancer that's turning on gene one. Well, if we, and the TADs are separated by uh, boundary regions or uh, TBRs as we sometimes call them. And then if there were an inversion such that you um, flip around part of the TAD on the right with the TAD on the left, you'll see that the enhancer element is now able to interact with gene two and the, uh, is no longer able to interact with gene one. So it's regulating the wiring of the genome by its structural organization. And the same type of different elements can go on in terms, or mechanism go, can go on with duplications, deletions, if you saw a deletion that was wholly inside the TAD and didn't disrupt the boundary region, there, as on the very bottom of this diagram, um, you can see that, in fact, there might not, not, might not be any um, effect on the uh, expression of the gene. So the disruption of the TAD structure rewires gene expression. So just a little more information on TADs. Um, again, t these TAD stands for topological associating domains. These are megabased size genomic segments, and they partition our genome into large regulatory units that have frequent intra-domain chromatin interactions, but relatively rare inter-domain interactions. So the interactions are in TAD a are more frequent than they, any interactions from A would be with TAD B. They're conserved across different cell types and species, considered crucial for spatiotemporal gene expression patterns, and they're separated, as I mentioned, by these TBRs, the topological boundary regions, which block the interactions between adjacent TADs. And we've learned that disruption of the TBR by structural rearrangements causes rewiring of genomic regulators that may result in abnormal phenotypes. So let's go back and think about the DGAP-103 phenotype and the finding of brachydactyly, which I felt must be mediated by an effect on parathyroid hormone-like hormone that was located uh, telomeric to the breakpoint on the short arm of the uh, chromosome 12. Of course, I told you that I was familiar with that gene when I saw it come across my desk in a manuscript for review because we had looked for a fusion transcript with um, a part of HMGA2 but had not found that. So below, you can see a schematic of the TAD and with the boundary elements indicated in gray on each end, and the position of the breakpoint on the short arm of chromosome 12 uh, within, a, within the TAD that includes parathyroid hormone-like hormone. So everything seemed to be falling into place to, to really uh, reinforce that this gene was dysregulated and was the etiology of brachydactyly in DGAP-103. Now, we looked also at the genes that were in around a four megabase region of the breakpoint, and you can see that I've highlighted parathyroid hormone-like hormone. It's the only gene in that area which is known or predicted to have a gene dosage in effect. And of, and of course, this is information that's derived from manuscripts like that which came from the Munlos lab where it was known that uh, inactivation of this gene would result in the clinical phenotype of, of brachydactyly. So now we had a whole new way of assessing uh, chromosome rearrangements and trying to predict or understand the phenotypes that we observed. I want to talk, talk to you about another case that's uh, been the subject of one of my graduate students' work, Sam Schillett, whose smiling face is looking at you from the screen on the bottom of the right-hand 
of the screen. So she has taken on the study of oligospermia in a 20-year-old, 28-year-old white male who presented with a two-year history of infertility and a sperm count less than two million per mil. He had no other dysmorphic features and had normal stature, normal FSH, LH, and testosterone, and had a normal semen volume. He had had a a very good workup by his uh, physician. In addition, the physician had requested a cytogenetic analysis and it was found that he had a t translocation involving chromosomes 20 and 22. In addition, he had an array CGH uh, assay performed and that was um, determined to be within normal limits. And in addition, as part of his genetic testing, it was determined that there was no Y chromosome deletion in the uh, AZF regions, and he was negative for any mutation in the cystic fibrosis uh, gene, the CFTR gene. You can see on the right the schematics of the uh, chromosomes and the derivative 20 and the derivative 22, which have exchange segments that appear to be balanced at the level of routine cytogenetic testing. So the next step was to actually define those breakpoints to nucleotide level resolution, which we did with the jumping library method, and then describe that uh, breakpoint on the two rearrangement, uh, two derivative chromosomes, and you can see the the next generation cytogenetic nomenclature, which was the uh, work of a, a very gifted uh, postdoc in the lab, Zara Ordelu, and you can see Zara, uh, Zara's photo on this uh, slide as well. So now we can actually describe, we can make a method to actually describe the, uh, the rearrangement of the chromosome at a, at a level that includes precision down to a nucleotide level. So the next question for us was really um, what was disrupted or potentially dysregulated? And it turns out that there was a disruption of a gene. And you can see on the uh, chromosome 20 in the TAD to the, to the, on the left side of the figure, um, there's a line drawn through this gene CDH4. We thought a lot about CDH4 and didn't really have a good model for how this might uh, impact his fertility. And we sort of put the case aside for a while. Um, and of course, that was before we knew about TADS. And you can see that the breakpoint that occurred on the 22 um, in this large pink TAD was actually outside of any uh, coding gene. So my graduate student, Sam, was very clever and did an experiment I would have never told her to do, but that's what the, the beautiful thing about graduate students is they, they think beyond their mentors. And in this case, she decided to look at the, to do a, a PCR experiment of all the genes that were in the TADS to assess their expression. And you'll note right away, there is a very uh, large uh, height of the bar over uh, the last gene in the TAD on chromosome uh, 20, and that's a gene that has the gene symbol p 2 Well, this was a really interesting gene because it's a gene that's expressed in male meiosis, and it now has been potentially dysregulated by the chromosome rearrangement. And you can, I should also tell you that the, the uh, cells that we're testing are lymphoblastoid cell lines, and the controls are basically age and sex matched individuals with who are karyotypically normal. So there was a huge increase in the expression of, of p 2 relative to the controlled lymphoblastoid cell lines. And uh, p 2 is really has unappreciable expression in lymphoblastoid cell lines and is really a, a testis-expressed um, transcript. 
So this was pretty surprising and pretty interesting because this is a gene that was really interesting from the standpoint of um, meiosis and potentially fertility. So one thing that um, Sam did was to, to establish that the uh, uh, expression from SICP2 was coming specifically from the from one allele, that this allele had been upregulated due to the chromosome rearrangement. So you can see on the top um, the, the uh, sequencing um, uh, chromatograms from both um, CYCP2 and GAPDH, where you see uh, that there's, there are polymorphisms and, and that there are different variants on the two alleles. And when you pre prepare RNA from uh, the cell line, you find that there's only, that you, you don't see any um, polymorphism in the CYCP2 uh, uh, chromatogram because all the transcript is coming from one allele. Yet in the GAP DH, you also see, see the same uh, amount of variation as you see in the chromatogram from the uh, DNA tracing. So you look you know, comparing the DNA of SICP2 with the RNA, you see that we don't see any variation indicating that the transcript is coming from one allele. Well, then she uh, decided not only do we need to establish that it's coming from one allele, but we need to know that it's coming from the allele that is involved with the chromosome rearrangement. And the rearrangement was at some distance from this gene, so she developed a method um, using proximity ligation um, to identify that through high c technologies that the transcript uh, came about from positioning of sequence from chromosome 22 near to uh, CYCP2 that would allow transcript from the derivative 20 allele. And you'll see that again below, that the, the, the DNA sequence is polymorphic, the RNA sequence and the derivative 20 uh, transcript sequence match identically. So this is proving that the uh, abnormal transcript is coming from the the chromosome that's involved in the, in the rear chromosome rearrangement. Well, this is an interesting gene, as I said. It encodes uh, synaptonemal complex 2 protein, and this is a protein that's involved in prophase 1 in meiosis, and it's uh, involved in the pairing of homologous chromosomes, uh, positioning them for uh, genetic recombination through crossing over. So it's a very important uh, protein in, in human uh, male meiosis. So um, to just leave that story at this point, I will tell you that there are some many exciting experiments ongoing in the lab to look at the uh, possibility and what we feel is the likely origin that there is an enhancer adoption. So an enhancer that is coming into the vicinity through the rearrangement of the TAD to upregulate SICP2. We don't have um, the opportunity to test this in the test this in the testis um, um, because the tissue is not available, but. Um, it seems likely that that would be the etiology of the upregulation. So I'd like to move you now to think about um, how we might use this information in prenatal cytogenetics. So if you like, if you'll uh, accept prenatal next-gen cytogenetics, I'm going to tell you about 10 pregnancies with balanced rearrangements. All 10 were high-risk pregnancies, either because of advanced maternal age or an abnormal maternal screen or ultrasound. And nine were known to be de novo rearrangements. The 10th one, we never received the information to confirm that it was a de novo rearrangement. And typically, the way we handle these in the clinical cytogenetics laboratory is to rely on a publication from uh, Dorothy Warburton, who was a, a wonderful clinical cytogeneticist. 
And she published a paper in the early 1990s looking at the risk of an untoward outcome from the diagnosis of a de novo, apparently balanced rearrangement in, a pre in the prenatal setting and then seeing what happened at delivery. And the risk of an untoward outcome that we still quote today for a translocation is 6.1 percent and, and for an inversion, 9.4 percent. So the cases that I'll describe for you, um, a selection of the cases, all had normal array CGH. So no indication that the chromosome uh, rearrangement itself resulted in any deletion or duplication in, in repairing the, the broken chromosomes that have exchanged segments. So now, as I said, we can move to studying these rearrangements at nucleotide level precision. So to just summarize the 10 prenatal cases before describing some of them in detail, uh, the predicted outcomes of our sequence analysis and, uh, analysis and interpretation, um, and this was prior to us being able to think about the, the structure of chromatin, um, especially the TAD uh, structure in these chromosomes in terms of making the interpretation. So we predicted three were likely to, to have normal outcomes and five were abnormal. One was from disruption of the CHD7 gene. That's consistent with a syndrome known as, known as CHARGE syndrome. One, dysregulation of SOX9, consistent with the phenotype of Pierre Robin sequence. One, um, dysregulation of IGF2, which is known in Silver Russell syndrome. One, a MTM1 dysregulation that could explain an intrauterine fetal demise. And then another case with um, sonic hedgehog and MEF2C dysregulation in a very complex chromosome rearrangement involving a four-way rearrangement and a two-way rearrangement um, consistent with a chromothripsis uh, in which there was notably cerebral malformation and a hypoplastic corpus callosum. The outcomes or decisions of these cases that I, these uh, d cases included two terminations and uh, one of those was a case that we would have made a prediction of a normal outcome and one of an abnormal outcome. So there was a disruption of protein coding genes in three cases. Uh, one was the CHD7 gene in CHARGE syndrome. One was KHDRB3, which is known, which we predicted to be a variant of uncertain significance. And uh, this was before we, again, would be able to interpret it based on the TAD. And I will talk to you a little bit more about that case. And then one, um, RFC3, which is a variant also we predicted of uncertain clinical significant significance, which would have been predicted to have a potential TAD effect. Um, then there were genes that appeared dysregulated with known long-range regulatory regions such as SOX9 and the SHH and MEF2C. And then there are some other uh, dysregulated uh, regions that I'll talk to you about which occurred in non-genic regions of the genome. So here's the first case, uh, DGAP239. This was, came from a 38-year-old who had had a history of infertility. This was her second pregnancy and it was a much desired pregnancy following IVF. She had normal first trimester screening but about 19 weeks, it was noted that there was tricuspid atresia and hypoplastic right ventricle. And between that time and uh, 27 weeks, there were multiple appointments with pediatric cardiologists and pediatric cardiology, cardi cardiac surgeons 
to consider a repair of the heart defect. But at 27 weeks, the picture became a bit more morbid with polyhydramnios and an undetected stomach. I should mention that the patient was offered the opportunity to have um, an invasive procedure for a definitive um, diagnosis of, of the amniotic fluid cell um, chromosome karyotyping uh, and had declined that um, in part because this was a very precious pregnancy and the couple didn't want to take a chance of disrupting the pregnancy. At 33 weeks, um, again, the situation became more morbid with flexed extremities, a protruding upper lip, and micronathia. And that, at that point, the initiation of multiple therapeutic amnio reductions and karyotyping. And it was at that time that a sample was received in the cytogenetics lab for um, karyotyping. And what we found was that there was an apparently balanced rearrangement between chromosome 6 and chromosome 8. And you'll see the 8 uh, breakpoint Q13 indicated in green type, and that's um, a theme that will be present in the next few slides in which that's the original assignment by the cytogenetics lab. But by karyotype, by, by sequencing analysis, you can see that we refined the breakpoint, and that has occurred commonly when we've sequenced rearrangements to nucleotide level uh, um, precision. So the breakpoint is now at positioned at Q12.2. So in the ideograms on the right, you can see the green area, which corresponds to the breakpoints by cytogenetics. So that's the range of that area of the genome. But of course, once you sequence the rearrangement, you can just draw a line precisely where that uh, breakpoint occurs. And you'll see in the derivative chromosome 8 on the right that the, the breakpoint is occurring in CHD7. The breakpoint on chromosome 6 also disrupted a gene LMBRD1, uh, and based on our assessment of, of uh, the pot potential phenotype of, of that, we believe that it was not involved in the clinical phenotype. At 35 weeks, there was, again, another clinical phenotype of undescended testis. And the clinical diagnosis that re was received at birth was CHARGE syndrome. So we gave this information, um, which was consistent with the clinical phenotype. But now we can go back and relook at this case with respect to the structural organization of the genome and the TAD. Uh, and I will tell you that this baby um, passed away at uh, 10 days after delivery. So we use, even with before TADS, the convergent genomic analysis information. So any, any um, information we can get about clinical phenotype. But of course, in this particular case, it was well recognized that a disruption of CHD7 accounted for the clinical phenotype. So you can see above in the um, horizontal bars that we're presenting under both derivative chromosomes, the derivative chromosome 6 and the derivative chromosome 8. And the TAD structure is given above a schematic of what the, the chromosome would be like with the two derivative the two portions of the two different chromosomes involved in the chromosome rearrangement. So you'll see above that um, in chromosome 6, the blue line is drawn through LMBRD1, indicating its uh, disruption and also um, in CHD7. So now we look at the TAD structure there, and our interpretation is that there were no additional genes which would be expect expected to have a dosage effect. Um, or imprinted genes that would then be um, contributing to the abnormal phenotype other than CHD7, in which CHARGE syndrome is well established. And below, you can see the next generation cytogenetic nomenclature that we use to describe this chromosome rearrangement to nucleotide level. So this seems to be that the interpretation was pretty much 
uh, spot on without any other um, additions to this based on looking at the TAD structure. So I'll take you to the next case. Um, this is DGAP 247, 41-year-old. Um, this was her third pregnancy. She, it was at 16 weeks. She had a normal first trimester screening, and the karyotype revealed a de novo uh, uh, paracentric inversion, an inversion in the long arm of chromosome 8. And as you'll not be surprised, as I've alluded to, we often end up changing the breakpoints, modifying them, revising them um, once we have the sequence analysis. And in this particular uh, case, again, you see in the ideogram those large uh, areas indicated in green shading that would, uh, would be consistent with the breakpoint resolution from cytogenetics, and then in the, where the red horizontal lines are, where, where the sequencing provides uh, precision. So in this case, there was a breakpoint in a non-genic region on the proximal portion of the long arm, and then in a gene known as KHDRBS3 on the distal end of the long arm. And this KHDRBS3 is an RNA binding protein that um, participates in regulating alternative splicing. Our genetic counseling for this finding with convergent genetic uh, genomic evidence um, led us to think that this could be consistent with a normal clinical outcome, um, and that's where that that's the information we provided. And then, um, when the baby was born, we were able to obtain a cord blood sample, and you can see in the red bars is the expression level of the, the patient. And then in, and actually, we got the cord blood on the bottom. You can see comparison for, to a normal cord blood. And then actually above in age and sex matched amniotic fluid cell culture. So there definitely is a decrease or, uh, um, it, sorry, a decrease in the expression of KHDRBS3, but it, you might consider that in the context of many genes in the genome, which one copy is sufficient, and perhaps that's what we were um, predicting in this potential case. So when we uh, did the TAD analysis, again, the same structure here with this slide with the derivative, um, the chromosome uh, rearrangement in, in the two sites on, in this case, an inversion on in the long arm of chromosome 8, where the breakpoint lands in a non-genic region in the proximal portion, but in, a, in, in the distal port uh, region of the chromosome in the inversion, you can see the line drawn through um, KHDRBS3. We, in the TAD analysis, we didn't, it did not reveal any monoallelic or imprinted genes that we would expect to be associated with an abnormal phenotype other than KHDRBS3, which you can imagine, we were really um, happy to, to have that conclusion at this point. Um, so that we didn't, uh, wouldn't have predicted that there would be any other abnormal phenotypes that we didn't discuss with the couple. And again, you see the nomenclature that we designed to uh, report the chromosome rearrangements to a uh, nucleotide level. So here's the third case. Um, this is a 44-year-old uh, G1 at 12 weeks. This was an unplanned pregnancy, um, and the it was a, had normal first trimester screening. The karyotype revealed a chromosome translocation involving chromosomes 2 and 13. You can see this uh, rearrangement. It was apparently balanced. Um, and was determined to be de novo. And then, um, as we have um, described previously, uh, the, the green areas indicate the resolution of the cytogenetics, and you can see the red lines indicate where the sequencing analysis allowed us to, to provide resolution. So one breakpoint was in a non-genic region on the derivative uh, two and on the derivative 13 chromosome, you can see that there is a uh, line drawn through a gene known as RFC3. RFC3 is an accessory protein that participates in the elongation 
um, in DNA replication known as a clamp lo loader. Um, so when we made the call to schedule the discussion about our findings, we learned that the pregnancy had been had already been terminated prior to um, our communication of the sequencing results. We were um, a little dis heartened about that because we felt that, uh, and this, this was an example of a case where we couldn't find any, any human pathology associated with um, RFC3 uh, haploinsufficiency or disruption. And so we would have been, um, again, interpreting it as a variant of uncertain clinical significance, but with some belief that, in fact, it could be associated with a normal clinical finding. So then we went on to, we looked at the expression of RFC3, and this was a CVS sample, and you can see that the level of expression of the gene in this DGAP248 case was below that seen in age and sex matched CVS samples. So there would be expected to be less um, uh, than the average uh, level of transcript of this protein. Um, and then we did the TAD analysis, and this was, every, I, I often say every one of these cases teaches us something new. Um, in this particular case, you can see, the, again, the blue uh, vertical line disrupting RFC3, and, uh, and no genes involved in the upper uh, portion where chromosome 2 is present, so there were, was no disruption of any uh, region that uh, we were concerned about. However, um, in addition to RFC3, which is uh, likely to be monoallelic in this case, that, as you saw with the, um, the expression studies, and, but, there, but again, not interpreted to necessarily be associated with any abnormal human phenotype. The breakpoints in the TAD uh, are at, in 13Q13.2 are 97 973 kil kilobases upstream to NBEA, which is a candidate haploinsufficient gene for autism. And this is located within the same 2.16 megabase TAD with the breakpoints. So uh, you can imagine that this was um, brought us to a level of concern about the situation that would have occurred for us if we had had this information and been in a position of providing that information to the couple, something that certainly couldn't be assessed in the prenatal situation and something that we know that in the future uh, we will be in a position of, of trying to uh, figure out how to handle providing this information to inform the couple, but also making it clear of the fact that this rem would remain a, a variant of uncertain significance. So now I'd just like to talk to you a bit about what happens when the DGAP breakpoints are in non-coding regions, and in particular, in cases in which both breakpoints are in non-coding regions. At this time in the study, we had looked at a, we had sequenced 151 cases. 17 didn't overlap genes, link RNAs or pseudogenes. They were 17 cases in non-coding regions. Uh, of the 17, 15 cases were referred with normal clinical microarrays, and two, um, there, no, array, no clinical array had, had been performed when the uh, specimen was uh, um, referred. So you can see where these 17 cases are located, and we have indicated where both breakpoints of the rearrangement are present. So this um, was picked up as a, a project of a, a also very talented uh, postdoc, Cynthia Zepeta Mendoza, and in collaboration with Jonas Ivan Salem, who had been working with Peter Robinson. So the, the schematic of the um, 
DNA sample is shown above with, uh, from a chromosome with um, enhancers, genes, CTCF uh, binding sites, which are associated with the, the TADs, and the types of chromatin contacts. And what we decided to do in this case, you see the, the balanced chromosome abnormality breakpoint in the red uh, vertical line, dotted line, is uh, disrupting a region that is, is non-genic. So Cynthia designed a, an approach to look at the TADs and to look at uh, regions both two, encompassing two megabases around the breakpoint and up to um, six megabases around each of these breakpoints. And look at uh, regulatory information, including enhancer annotations and DNA's hypersensitive sites then the chromatin confirmation, uh, TADs and interactions from high c analyses and enhancer promoter contacts, and then clinical data, um, whether the gene, whether there were genes predicted to have a gene dosage effect through haploinsufficiency, and then to take the, the findings of the um, clinical case and use the human phenotype ontology pheno phenomatch scores and see if she could develop an algorithm with this information that would lead to some prediction of a particular gene in the clinical phenotype. So this is um, the, just a summary of her work in predicting of the 17 cases, 11 present potential position effects. So you can see the karyotypes of the cases listed, um, uh, whether any functional elements were disrupted, and whether the breakpoints fell within TADs in a couple different cells, cell lines um, and sources of, of DNA which have been assessed for, for TAD structure. And then uh, top ranking candidate genes um, which are identified either in blue type because they are predicted to have a recessive uh, phenotype or um, ClinGen, they're, they're annotated in ClinGen. Um, others which uh, underline are particular ones where there may be a haplo insufficiency phenotype. So we gained quite a lot of information from this and um, I'll show you how we went ahead uh, and applied this information in one of the prenatal cases. So this was uh, DGAP-288. This was a 36-year-old fe uh, uh, female. At, this was her third pregnancy at 12 weeks. And there had been abnormal fetal ultrasounds in this pregnancy. Uh, cystic hygroma identified at 11 weeks and micronathia at 18 weeks. And a karyotype was performed indicated a balanced de novo chromosome rearrangement between chromosomes 6 and 17. And then, as you're familiar now, a, a revision of the breakpoints following sequencing. And again, uh, looking at the chromosome ideogram, seeing the precision of the prediction of the breakpoint by cytogenetics, and then a fine line drawn where the sequence analysis um, places the breakpoint. And the, this is a case, again, where the breakpoint fell in, on both derivative chromosomes in non-genic regions. So it turns out that um, we ended up predicting that this phenotype would be due to reduced SOX9 expression. Um, we were able to do RTQ-PCR and compare the expression in the CBS sample, cells from the CBS sample, um, with uh, other CVS samples that were, again, age and sex matched. And the fetal MRI at 36, 38 weeks and the postnatal findings, including small jaw index consistent with micronathia and rectornathia and glossoptosis and cleft palate, were suggestive of isolated uh, Pierre Robin sequence. And when we looked at the TAD analysis, we found that SOX9 was downstream of the um, breakpoint in 17Q at band 24.3, and it's within the same 1.88 megabase TAD with the breakpoints. And that's 
uh, an area that is known to have, uh, well known to have upstream cis regulatory region uh, for uh, expression of Pierre Robin sequence associated with SOX9 dysregulation. So the algorithm that Cynthia developed um, was able to make this prediction that SOX9 would be the likely candidate gene dysregulated in the, in the non-genic regions which were implicated by the sequencing analysis. And then again, you can see below our description of um, the cytogenetic rearrangement at, at nucleotide level precision. So I'd just like to summarize this presentation. Um, I hope that uh, you've, uh, you're coming away with a sense that the, the evaluation of genes disrupted or potentially dysregulated at chromosomal breakpoints truly requires nucleotide level precision, and this is a precision that's now possible with uh, the application of all the, the technologies of next generation sequencing. That TAD and haploinsufficiency analysis with convergent genomic evidence may be useful in assessing potential clinical significance and in informing genetic counseling. We're able to incorporate expression analysis in the testing um, that will allow us to expand assessment of potential positional effects, whether this will be possible in an actionable time frame uh, for prenatal diagnosis uh, remains to be um, really put into the, the uh, clinical pipeline, but um, it may not be possible, certainly in all cases, to have that um, information as well. Certainly, the nucleotide level resolution of the rearrangements is possible in an actionable time frame for prenatal diagnosis. And I can assure you that the rearrangements uh, may be simple or complex, uh, including those consistent with chromothripsis in, in the setting of normal uh, array. So thank you again for watching today's live presentation. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. I will be answering questions via email. I'd like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 10th of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again. Goodbye.